Welcome to Healthcare Du Jour, where we dish up and digest the latest in healthcare. For the next 30 minutes, sit back as we bring you insight, commentary, and discussion on trending topics to the table, all expertly served up by our host and his guests. Healthcare Du Jour is brought to you by Carium, the telehealth platform enabling healthcare's digital transformation, helping you care for people within the fabric of their daily lives. Now, here's your host, Matt Fisher. Welcome back, and thank you for joining as we dive into the hottest topics in healthcare. I'm your host, Matt Fisher. On the menu today is Dr. April Smith, Associate Professor of Psychology at Auburn University, the Director of the Research on Eating Disorders and Suicidality Laboratory, and the Co-Director of the Auburn Eating Disorders Clinic. Dr. Smith, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So what I always like to do before getting into the main part of the conversation is to give my guests a chance to provide more of an introduction in terms of who they are and what they do. So Dr. Smith, the floor is yours. Sure, sure. So um, great introduction. Yeah, my name is April and I uh, direct a lab that looks at the intersection between eating disorders and suicidal behavior at Auburn University. Um, So I've gotten the chance to live all over the country, started in Texas, did my PhD work in Florida, um, internship in California, a little stint in Japan teaching English and Um, I was actually at Miami University in Ohio for about 10 years and then moved to Auburn University about two years ago, um, where we've gotten to continue doing the research, looking at this intersection between eating disorders and suicide, uh, and actually also open an eating disorders clinic. So what first got you into healthcare? I'm always fascinated to know kind of what spurred people to get into this particular industry. Sure, sure. So, you know, I think two things. Um, I actually started out as an English major in, uh, in college and, um, ended up getting some B's in, in my English classes. And so realized I might need to think about a different path. Um, and at the same time, uh, took a really fantastic abnormal psychology class. And that got me really interested in mental illness. And then also, you know, kind of at that time was starting to see personal effects of mental illness within friends and family. Um, and also, you know, kind of witness, um, those friends and family, uh, really struggle to get good treatment. Uh, and so that became something that was really meaningful and powerful to me. Um, and, and really helped, uh, launch my career. So kind of with that personal experience, what drew you in particular to eating disorders? And, you know, kind of as you talked about that, if you could also just help define what what is meant by an eating disorder. Sure, sure. So, you know, I think um, not uncommon as a woman in our society, um, disordered eating was kind of all around me in uh, high school, college. Um, so it was something that, you know, I was seeing um, friends, family members engage in. Um, I didn't you know, at the time, I didn't know how serious to take it. And then I started to see um, some friends and family really start to suffer some some pretty serious consequences. Um, and, and again, it wasn't until I got more into my psychology degree that I started to understand, okay, that these are certain syndromes um, and there are differences between the eating disorders. Um, and so broadly with eating disorders, uh, these are serious and um, unfortunately often fatal mental health conditions. Um, I think what many people don't realize is that eating disorders actually used to be can be the most deadly psychological disorder. Um, they have now fallen to number two, but obviously that's still quite high. Um, they have now been outstripped of that sort of um, ignominious title by opioid um, addiction. Um, but they are serious fatal conditions um, where there's some kind of pronounced disturbance in eating behavior. And then there's often associated thoughts and emotional disturbance. Um, for example, like being really preoccupied by one's shape or weight. And, you know, there's um, kind of four main eating disorders. Uh, there's anorexia, which is really characterized by severe food restriction, uh, leading to very low body weight and malnourishment. Um, then there's bulimia nervosa, um, where people can be um, sort of any weight um, or, or shape or size. And this is characterized by periods of binge eating, and then um, sort of compensatory behaviors, um, which often include things like um, purging, but could also include things like fasting or over-exercise. 
Um, there's also binge eating disorder, um, which um, involves uh, periods of binge eating um, that are accompanied by a lot of kind of negative affect or guilt or shame, a lot of emotional turmoil. Um, and then one that's kind of less maybe well known is, um, it's a little bit of a mouthful, but it's called Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder, or ARFID. Uh, and this used to be a disorder that we kind of thought mostly happened in kids, but we're actually seeing that it, it can happen as all eating disorders can across the lifespan. And so this is an eating disorder where um, there, there really aren't the shape and weight concerns, but people are not eating oftentimes because of textural issues or uh, maybe um, traumatic things that have happened to them around eating or just a lack of hunger um, or maybe real um, severe kind of what, what we might think of as pickiness around food. And that can lead to severe uh, low weight or malnutrition. Um, and then outside of those kind of four main uh, recognized eating disorders, there's also this catch-all category, what we call um, other specified feeding and eating disorder or OSFED. Um, and interestingly, that's actually the largest group of eating disorders. So about 50% of people who come in for treatment might end up getting that kind of other specified diagnosis. And it's probably a longer conversation we could have at another point. But, you know, to me, what that indicates is that we're actually probably not defining our eating disorders in the best way if so many people are actually not meeting criteria for, for those other disorders. Yeah, and kind of picking up on that last point, that would also seem to suggest kind of given the traditional reluctance to talk about mental health disorders and, um, you know, kind of really getting into finer details that as that stigma start, it continues to erode, that would likely open the door for a refined understanding. Yes, yes, I definitely think so. And so and it kind of, you know, as you were talking about, you know, as you said, kind of the, the core four, you know, named conditions at the moment, and then the kind of that catch out category, you know, are there kind of commonalities in terms of um, factors that might trigger uh, someone to have an eating disorder, or, you know, whether it be internal or external? Definitely. So we do know, first of all, that there's a huge genetic component to all eating disorders. And so heritability estimates range between 50 to 80 percent, uh, which I think is another kind of surprising fact for most people. So those heritability estimates are actually similar to heritability estimates for things like um, IQ and height, you know, things that we know are very genetically um, um, linked Uh so there is a big biological component to all of the eating disorders. Um, that being said, we're still kind of in the, the infancy of understanding, you know, what genes are responsible. Obviously, it's not one gene. You know, it's likely hundreds, if not hundreds of thousands of, of genes that are responsible. Um, so, so biology plays a big point or a big, um, a big part in their development. Um, just to kind of put it another way. We know that people with an eating disorder are 12 times more likely to have had relatives with eating disorders than people without. Um, but um, certainly there are also environmental factors, you know, that are accounting for 20 to 50 percent of, of um, the variability as well. And what seems to be really big drivers are things like perfectionism Um as well as um, any possible experience um, like that, that could lead to dieting or a reduction in, in food intake, even, you know, getting sick potentially and having flu um, could, you know, trigger an eating disorder among vulnerable individuals. But unfortunately, dieting seems to be a, a pretty significant and salient risk factor, which is, um, I think we might talk about this later, but um, one of the reasons I'm very anti-diet, you know, kind of no matter what, um, just given that they can be um, so, so potent in terms of, um, you know, onsetting an eating disorder, particularly in vulnerable folks. And kind of thinking about those environmental factors, you know, you were talking about, you know, dieting or, you know, events that would encourage it. Uh, or you know, it might have been kind of a, a cause, a, a secondary causation yeah. effect from it. 
you know, are there particular, um, I don't know if triggers is the right word, but um, particular, uh, you know, types of things out there that are pushing those types of um, events that could be the causation point for an eating disorder? Yes. And I mean, I, I think that's where we see kind of a myriad of factors that could lead people to, um, you know, want to diet or become dissatisfied with their bodies and, you know, think about changing their, their diet. So, you know, it could be something like, um, you know, being on a, a, a sports team that has um, kind of a weight component or, you know, maybe you're trying to, um, you know, uh, excel in some way and you think that diet would would be the way to do it. Um, but then I think, uh, you know, certainly um, we're kind of inundated with appearance ideals um, and, you know, seeing now not just movie stars and celebrities with idealized images, um, but also, you know, on, on social media, it's our friends, it's influencers, you know, it's people who um, we consider to be peers uh, that now are also, you know, presenting these very idealized images, which, which then I think, um, you know, it's one thing to say, um, you know, okay, celebrities and supermodels have these bodies. I'm not them. But when we start to see our friends and, you know, people that we look up to, um, you know, also demonstrating these bodies, then it can start to feel, I think, even worse for folks and maybe more like they can do it you know, if they follow these diets and things like that. Yeah. And I think you kind of just called out, you know, social media, which, you know, often draws a lot of headlines and attention for, you know, pushing negative, per, you know, or I guess negative perceptions or um, encouraging act, actions and activities are going to have a negative impact on one's health. You know, so kind of from your research and from, you know, just your experience, you know, what are, I guess, some of the ways that social media really encourages that or kind of what are some of the specific behaviors that arise on social media that can be a large contributing factor? Yeah, it's a, it's a really great question. And um, I think also um, I, I want to be careful because I, you know, I don't think um, social media is just uniformly negative for people. I, 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 so hopefully we can also find a space to talk about some of the good that I think can come from social media. But our team actually um, did a, a study, gosh, I think about 10 years ago. So we were one of the first people to actually at that time look at Facebook, um, which was the kind of predominant social media site at the time in relation to eating disorder symptoms. Um, and what we found was that a specific type of Facebook usage, what we termed maladaptive Facebook usage, was associated with bulimic symptoms actually at a later time point. And um, so actually predicting future engagement in, you know, binging and purging behavior. Um, and so that uh, kind of maladaptive Facebook usage was really um sort of characterized by people who were engaging in social comparisons. So not necessarily, um, you know, the folks who are, um, you know, interacting with friends and family and messaging and things like that, um, but actually kind of going on and sort of um, saying, you know, how do I uh, compare to these other people? And that's what was really kind of driving that, that later bulimic um, behavior. Um, researchers have since uh, kind of confirmed that in other uh, social media sites like Instagram and, and TikTok, although I will say that the TikTok research is like really in its infancy, given the, the newness of that platform. Um, but it does seem that um, to the extent that people are engaging in comparisons, um, which are much easier to do on the more visual um, sites like Instagram and, and TikTok, that that is more related to body dissatisfaction, disordered eating, uh, and dieting. And so, yeah, that, that would be kind of the, the, the main uh, type of social media use that tends to be uh, pernicious. But then also just, um, you know, I think the fact that social media allows people to really highly edit and curate photos and again, present these um, really idealized images that, you know, I think on some extent we all kind of know are likely edited and idealized. But interestingly, 
research has found even if we put disclaimers on edited photos, um, people still feel bad uh, after looking at them um, if they're presenting these, uh, you know, kind of appearance ideals. So even if we know that they're likely not an indication of reality, they still make us feel bad, make us feel bad about our bodies, which, again, can then lead to dieting and, and worse things. Yeah, it's a very interesting point that you said, even if it's very clearly labeled that an image has been altered or yeah. edited, that it still produces that negative uh, impact. And yeah. for those of you just joining, I'm talking about Dr. April Smith from Auburn University, and we're talking about eating disorders and just kind of getting into social media's impact. You know, so kind of to that last point around, even if you know things have been edited, I wonder if there's yet any evidence around, you know, kind of what seems to be that growing trend of, you know, people doing the side-by-side -side comparison of this is the Instagram versus reality. Yeah. Um, you know, some of it seems a little tongue in cheek when I see see them, but others, you know, do seem to be trying to show just how things have been touched up. So I, as I said, I don't know if there's any data yet showing the impact yeah. of, of those types of sharings. Yeah, I'm not aware of that, but it's a really great idea, um, you know, for a, a future study. And, you know, if given what I know about the research, um, suggesting that even when we know these images are edited, I, I kind of feel like any exposure to these um, idealized images actually has the potential to, to trigger that dissatisfaction, um, even when you've got pretty strong evidence that it's not accurate. Yeah, no, I think that's pretty fair. And then it, you know, it would also based on, you know, kind of the, the reports and some of the complaints that are out there, you know, that the companies themselves know that since there have been a lot of assertions that the algorithms built into those platforms purposefully push certain yeah. images to the top to kind of, which sounds like it would reinforce kind of those negative perceptions or the negative impacts that you're referencing. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, the, the, the algorithm piece I think is one of the most pernicious pieces that probably for all mental health conditions, but um, you know, as I was kind of mentioning, I think um, there actually can be some good usage of social media. There are some great um, sites out there that promote um, body appreciation, body positivity, body neutrality. Um, you know, and, and I, to be fair, I'm very, um, I do not really use social media in part because of this. Um, I've actually just found it's better for my mental health to stay off. Um, but I do have a, accounts for kind of professional reasons. And even with my very curated, and I would say, um, you know, uh, body appreciative kind of feed, you know, I still get pushed what I consider to be really harmful messages. And um, there's, it, it just seems like there's no way to avoid them, even if you're doing your best to, to actually, um, you know, engage in, in healthy, um, and, in positive and supportive social media following or, you know, um, uptake. So, um, you know, I, I think that is one of my real concerns, particularly like I can just shut it off, but, um, you know, I think for younger folks, um, and just, you know, more visual platforms like TikTok, where the algorithm is designed to push more extreme content, um, it, it almost by default is going to go, I think, into these potentially negative directions. Yeah. And I guess, you know, kind of as you were hinting at, there are definitely positives to yeah. use of social media. And, you know, kind of like you, I tend to use it more on a professional basis. Yeah. So it kind of self-selects in that direction. Yeah. But you know, to be able to provide that kind of that balanced approach, you know, would you be able to dive into kind of the, those positive aspects that you see and the ways that maybe social media can, you know, help an individual as they're, um, you know, trying to work their way through an eating disorder? Yeah, for sure. So there certainly are eating disorder support groups that people can join. There, like I said, are some great influencers, influencers, um, there's a great Instagram feed called I underscore way that's, um, run by Jamila Jamil. And it's, uh, really a kind of a body appreciative space, um, and really accepting of kind of all, all bodies, um, that I think can, can promote, um, a lot of really great messages. Um, and similarly, I think, um, 
people are, you know, savvy people are able to um, actually uh, critique some of, you know, the companies themselves, um, advertising campaigns, things like that, and actually do that through social media, you know, when they see um, ad campaigns that have been really heavily edited or depicting, you know, grossly um, impossible images, they can actually, you know, kind of form coalitions and and really have some positive change, um, you know, uh, kind of um, calling out various companies. And so I think those are all, you know, really great things. Um, and, and And certainly to the extent that people um, or just using social media to, you know, keep up relationships and friendships. I think those are all positives. I, I think the thing that I really struggle with is, you know, can you have a, a fully positive social media uh, experience without all these, you know, negatives? I, I, I just don't know. Um, and the the other thing that I think about um, that relates to our own research is the idea, like to the extent that people are kind of more passively engaging um, with social media versus actively creating content. Um, and so to the extent that people are um, actively creating content, by definition, you're thinking about how other people are going to perceive that. What are other people going to think about um, this podcast, for example, or, um, you know, certainly for more visual things, how are people going to see me? What are they going to think about me? And that, by definition, creates um, like an observer stance that you have to take to your, towards yourself, which can increase the objectification that you have of your own body. And we know that increased self-objectification is a risk factor for eating disorders. So um, I do think to the extent that people are are creating content, they want to try to be um, maybe checking in with themselves about how much is this pulling them outside of themselves and perhaps, um, you know, allowing them to think of themselves in more objectified ways or just start to even lose touch with some of their own internal cues. Yeah, no, I think it's a very interesting point. But as you said, it's you know, when you're creating content in any form, you're kind of divorcing from yourself to, to a degree because you're, as you said, trying to create that self-assessment and trying to step into the shoes of someone else viewing yeah. it to figure out how are they going to perceive that. Yeah, yeah. So kind of, I know we've talked a lot about social media, but you know, how are other, or the, kind of the evolution of technology in other spaces influencing or impacting, um, you know, I guess either the prevalence of eating disorders or, or, you know, maybe more positively, the ability to provide support and help to uh, individuals who are going through an eating disorder uh, and trying to improve their health. Yeah, another really fantastic question. And I think, um, you know, obviously uh, there was, um, when we think about the pandemic, one silver lining, I think, for mental health was the shift to telehealth out of necessity and being able to to see that we actually can, um, you know, successfully treat eating disorders a lot of times via telehealth, I think has been a, a real gift. Uh, and, and, you know, now having the technology to, to do that in, you know, HIPAA safe ways, um, it is fantastic. So, um, you know, I think one of the, the biggest ways that technology is helping us is, yeah, being able to, to provide eating disorder treatment via telehealth. Um, there have been, uh, the development of, you know, kind of big, um, bigger companies. Um, Equip is a big company that provides empirically supported family-based treatment, actually, um, to people, I think, under the age of 25, um, all via telehealth. Um, so that's fantastic. And then it's also um, allowed for researchers to develop um, kind of guided self-help versions of treatments. Um, for example, cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced is one of the leading empirically supported treatments for eating disorders. And um, researchers have been able to develop guided self-help versions that can now be delivered online, um, which again, I think is really great. Um, you know, some people that, that could be um, an appropriate level of intervention and, and really help get them better. Researchers like myself, you know, we're also um, designing online uh, interventions that um, tend to be shorter and 
Um, you know, again, my, the hope within our lab is to make them freely accessible. So, you know, I think it, in general, some of these advances are allowing us to, to reach people who maybe otherwise couldn't get treatment. Um, so increasing accessibility, um, but also as people are, you know, experimenting with new treatments, you know, putting them out there for, for low or reduced or even free cost, um, which is a really great thing. You know, another kind of exciting avenue, I think, with with technological advances is, you know, I've got my um, Apple Watch on right now. Um, but there are um, researchers um, like Sherry Levinson and Adrian Gerasio, um, among others, who are starting to do work um, with patients with eating disorders using wearables and, you know, actually trying to use machine learning algorithms to be able to detect in real time whether or not there might be these kind of physiological or biological signals um, that could predict uh, eating disorder behaviors. And kind of with, you know, as you're describing, a very broad availability of also a very diverse kind of array of interventions or treatment options, you know, how would an individual be able to kind of sort through and be able to determine which which tools are kind of valid and backed by appropriate um, information understanding and which might be kind of treading a line where it's not as clear that it, it, there's an effective um, intervention being uh, offered? That is such a great and important question um, because we know just like, uh, you know, not all maybe um, medical treatments are created equal, not all therapeutic, um, you know, treatments have as much evidence behind them. And so, um, you know, a great place would be to go to like the National Eating Disorder Association website or the Association um, for Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies, ABCT. Um, and those actually on their websites will publish uh, guidelines about empirically supported treatments. Um, but in general, um, cognitive behavioral therapy enhanced, which was made for eating disorders, is one of our best treatments for anorexia or bulimia or binge eating disorder. Um, and then for people who are tend to be under the age of 18, family-based therapy um, is really the, the best bet. Um, a big caveat, though, with um, really any of our eating disorder treatments is that we see about 50% of people respond and get better, which means that about 50% don't. Um, and we oftentimes see that um, outpatient therapy is not enough. Um, people may need to get a higher level of care. So this could be um, like intensive outpatient or actually, um, you know, a hospitalization Um and, you know, oftentimes people need um, repeated um, uh, episodes of treatment before they start to see improvement, unfortunately. Yeah, and although I think that's a great point to raise, though, that, you know, oftentimes it sounds like it can take kind of a combination of different modalities of treatment. Yeah. And, you know, unfortunately, we're already out of time. So I think that's going to have to be a, you know, kind of a really great final takeaway for folks, you know, as they think about that, there is no kind of single way to go through treatment, but it's, you know, trying to make sure that there's ongoing support. But I want to thank my guest, Dr. April Smith, for a great conversation today. Yes, thanks so much for having me. And yeah, just to end, um, recovery absolutely is possible. And I would say the best predictor of recovery is early intervention. No, that's great. And thank you to everyone listening. Keep the dialogue going and connect with me at hashtag H-C-D-E-J-U-R-E. I'm Matt Fisher. Until next time.